So I make a very short introduction. Peter Hellig of Taylor Wessing, uh, a law firm very much involved in all kinds of clean tech deals. Yes. And then we have Jörg Sperling of Web Partners. It's one of the uh, UK-based uh, clean tech focused VCs, I could say. Correct. And we have uh, Felix von Schubert, another clean tech VC by heart and by uh, motivation <coughs> uh, from Zook Ventures. And then we have um, Bruno Derungs. You already know him if you have uh, heard his talk before from Climate Change Capital. And we would like to talk about what are the big trends in the sector, um, in the clean tech sector, and where, are the, where should the money go and where do you guys take your money? So um, let's uh, give yourself um, a round of uh, like a one minute elevator pitch each and maybe you give a start. Well, naturally the lawyer is perhaps not the best one to start with um, because uh, our function is not really the function <coughs> of being trend scouts because when something hits our desks you know it has become reality. But um, sometimes even lawyers um, uh, can detect certain trends when talking to their clients and one of the areas that we currently found particularly interesting is that when we are talking to manufacturers of uh, renewable energy generation facilities, for example, wind turbine manufacturers or water um, uh, turbine manufacturers, they found it increasingly difficult with increasing numbers of devices sold and an increasing demand to actually um, catch up with their service lines and to provide the maintenance services, the supply of spare parts and all other related work and services they need to deliver to their clients mm. or to their customers. Mm. And this is why they are, as we see, um, increasingly coming up with the idea to either outsource these services or to build up new service lines themselves which um, will see significant growth. And uh, we have already also heard from the other side, from the investor side, that this could be a sector that is quite interesting for them to invest in these service sectors for actually providing maintenance and supply part delivery services to um, uh, wind park operators and uh, whatever, so to large project um, companies. Mm. Good, yeah, my name is George Sperling. Um, we are a London and Munich-based fund. We invest in the so-called growth stage, so we don't do early-stage venture. We start looking at companies 10 million euro beyond and upwards, um, all the way up to, to buyouts, corporate um, carve-outs. Um, um, we stopped using the crystal ball to top down, say those are the areas we would like to look at and spend on. Um, we are um, more um, opportunistic. Um, of course, certainly um, on a regular basis, um, you find yourself stuck into a segment um, where if you looked at five, six companies, um, you find the next 20 or 30 companies and you um, develop sort of a certain competence in a segment. Um, so we've done um, actually most or all of our investment to date has been outside of the renewable energy area. So we have no solar, no wind, no biomass investment in the portfolio. I think this has to do with the fact that we also like capital light uh, investment. So we have uh, investments in the software area. We have uh, investments in recycling, in water, in old industrial technology that is uh, that got on the on the green bandwagon and are growing there what all of these companies have in common is uh, they must have a product or a service that um, has a global application we tend mm. to grow our businesses globally very quickly because in particular in the clean tech f field um, um, we see this being a very global economy so although the Companies are all based in Europe. Actually, if you take a look at where the revenue is generated, the majority of the revenue for these companies is generated outside of Europe. So we like these companies that you can internationalize very quickly and rapidly. Felix. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> Felix von Schubert. I'm a founder and partner at uh, Zook uh, Ventures. Zook is a 12-year-old um, fund based in London. We now have offices also in Singapore. 
uh, and uh, we're a small team of 20 investment professionals. Um, we invest currently about 350 million euros in this market in two areas. Uh, the main area for us is clean tech investments. Those are companies that have uh, product <coughs> revenue or service revenue somewhere between 10 and 100 million euros when we uh, invest, and we tend to invest somewhere between 10 and 20 million euros ourselves. Um, that's the one area, and the other area is infrastructure. We have a separate infrastructure team and uh, infrastructure fund where we invest in renewable energy projects uh, as an equity investor. Clearly, there are a lot of synergies between, uh, between the two uh, areas, because on the one hand, we have the technologies. On the other hand, we can see directly what is the market impact, what's the pricing that's sustainable in the market, um, and uh, how can we grow those companies. On the clean tech side, we have sort of three areas that we currently invest. One is renewable energy. Uh, we have been an, uh, quite an active investor in the solar space, among other areas there. Um, we tend not to be sort of the typical module investor, investor in the, in the module. We look for areas that are much less regulatory driven. We look for areas that can save cost in very particular uh, areas. Just to maybe give you one example, three years ago we invested in a company that recycles the slurry required in cutting wafers in the solar industry. By using uh, the service, wafer manufacturers can save up to 25% of the entire wafer production cost. Those are the type of areas we look at <coughs> and, uh, and like. And maybe just to briefly mention two other main areas for us. One is energy efficiency and smart grid is a big area of that um, in different areas. It could be the communication layer. We're looking at demand response. So the presentation we just saw, uh, I think, is a very interesting, very relevant area. And then the third area is, uh, is water and other recycling technologies. Water, to a large extent, is recycling for us. It is recycling of water, reuse of water, reduction uh, of cost for industrial players that require water as one of the main components of the activities. Bruno. Very good. Uh, yeah, I have had a presentation this afternoon. I just want to summarize briefly what we are doing. I'm a partner at Climate Change Capital and a founding partner of the Private Equity <coughs> Fund. Uh, we manage over a billion uh, euros in different funds and activities. And uh, the private equity fund is a 200 million business that focuses on uh, the five major uh, clean tech sectors, which are clean power, clean transport, energy efficiency, waste and water. Uh, we follow a similar strategy as our colleagues, uh, on our, as my colleagues here on the panel, which is later stage investment proven concepts. We are uh, opportunistic in the sectors where we invest. Uh, the main arguments have also been made, of course, uh, asset light is better than asset heavy. However, if you have a very interesting proposal there, why not looking at it? Uh, energy efficiency is very interesting. We've done an investment in a, what we believe a very important contributor to the smart grid uh, in the future. And, uh, and we have done another energy efficiency investment in an LED space uh, company, which uh, seems to be very attractive in terms of return of capital employed. Uh, so this is basically <coughs> what we do in terms of our investment focus. If I do understand correctly, uh, all of you uh, guys uh, don't like to do seed stage investments because uh, maybe they are too risky. What is um, really the reason and uh, what is a minimum requirement in terms of revenue that you are um, um, requiring or in order to, to do an investment? Should I start? Yeah. I, so, I, I mean, the reason why we don't do early stage uh, investments is because the uh, clean tech field itself is still a new area. Uh, you have a lot of market risk. Um, um, and if on top of the market risk uh, you add technology uh, risk, you may have a risk profile um, that is not manageable um, any longer. And 
if you would work the numbers backwards, um, if we would make early stage seed investments there, um, the pre-money valuations uh, would be in areas where no entrepreneur would or should consider this. Um, but that's the sort of discount we would need to, given this, this multiplied risk there, to, to make uh, our target returns there. Mm. Um, so that's just the, the financial economics. If you take a look at the, at the data, the returns for early stage investment in that segment have not been good uh, because of those um, two risks that you that you pretty much multiply um, there. The second reason why um, I think we're looking at more later stage opportunities is because there are enough late stage opportunities. Um, uh, we um, have have gone through a history now. I think if we would have had this conference uh, six, seven years ago, it's very difficult um, as a fund to say I'm making late stage investments in the clean tech segment. Um, um, for whatever investment strategy you have in the private equity industry, you're always trying to um, have a funnel where you look at at, at least 1,000 companies uh, per year. Um, and today, um, with an investment focus, later stage in clean tech, you get to those numbers. And probably five, six years ago, that would, would have been very difficult or impossible. If you look mm. at 1,000 deals per year, how many deals do you actually make per year? So we made four investments over the course of the last 12 months. 0.4%. And in your case, Felix? I think the ratio is probably quite similar. Uh, can I just add one, one point to the early versus late stage uh, discussion? We have to realize that, yes, we want to invest in asset light companies, no question. But realistically, clean tech is, in many, many instances, not asset light. You need to build prototypes, they cost money, you need to test it, that takes time. It's longer and it's more capital intensive than if you invest in software companies and IT companies. It's just a, the way it is. Therefore, if you invest early, you have to have a much, much longer time frame than most of us have. Most of us, I assume, are sort of three to six year type holders of stakes in companies. If you're an early stage investor, you need 10 years plus in many, many instances. And that does, doesn't work as a, as a business model. Um, however, we are working very closely with a number of, uh, of other investors that do invest in early stage companies. Among them are corporates, we have a close relationship with a number of corporates that are actively looking for early stage opportunities mm -hmm. to either invest as a minority investor, to partner with, and we want to make sure we can provide those contacts to early stage companies where we're not yet able to invest, but mm -hmm. where we can provide that, those relationships, and then maybe in two or three years' time, then come back <coughs> as a financial backup of those companies. Bruno, do you think there is enough uh, early stage investors if you are not uh, part of the group? Um, I have the feeling we need more early stage yeah. guys. Mm -hmm. We need more people taking the risk. Yeah, I mean, clean tech is really, uh, of course, a financial uh, opportunity, but it's also, um, at least for me personally, a mission. We really need to, uh, to have the long-term view because uh, it's a, a survival task, isn't it? Bruno I, yeah, uh, I mean, I absolutely agree with you that we need uh, early stage investors. The, the question is just who, who should do that? Because yeah. as, as we have heard from a lot of reasons, we are investing 90% of our money is pension money. Uh, so maybe some of your people uh, people from Holland or from UK are even invested in our fund without knowing it. <laughs> and, uh, <That's> cool. <laughs> and we have a responsibility to, to return some money back to the investors that have invested in our fund. Now, uh, uh, a lot of things have been mentioned in the past, <coughs> but uh, the question is always why do US VC investors make so much money and why are you not taking the same risks here? And there is a fundamental difference between the US VCs that invest in tech companies and have been very successful because they are asset light. You can be, they're consumer related. You have a large market and then you can bring this up. And in a fund portfolio structure, you only need one or two mm. successes in order to make your return. Mm. Now, if you start to translate that into the clean tech, you have the issue that you have sometimes capital intensive uh, environments and doesn't need to be your direct investment, but the driver of the market can be capital intensive, system related issues. 
and that makes it much slower, much heavier to move it forward. That means that you will never see the same multiples in, in a clean tech investment, I, I predict, as, as for instance, uh, people did in Amazon, eBay, or whatever it is, it is kind of a, a fantastic clean tech, uh, fantastic investments were. Therefore, we chose the strategy of, of really being a little bit risk averse, averse, invest more money in single units. We do. We start from five to ten million, go up to twenty if it needs to be more. We can even do that during the lifetime of a fund, and then to return a reasonable return to the investors per deal, which then adds up to a nice portfolio uh, return. Well, I mean, regarding the question who actually should, should fill that gap or who should be the ones who invest in early stages, we at least, I believe, have one person in the room here in the audience who could very well answer that question. It should be Alexander von Frankenberg sitting <laughs> down there in the last row. <laughs> um, because uh, I think that he's perfectly doing that job, and I don't only just tell that because, um, well, they are a client of ours, as I can proudly say, but um, I there is a certain trend that you can recognize all over Europe that state-sponsored um, uh, early-stage funds will presumably take that place because it's clear that, let's call them the commercial investors, need a feedstock of uh, new companies, and of course you somehow need to um, foster a founder's culture in these countries. And this is uh, where I believe these state-sponsored funds, also taking in some private money, as the High Tech Gründer Fund does, um, can take that position. And uh, they increasingly do that, I believe. And I mean, Alexander von Frankenberg is sitting on a portfolio of more than 200 companies, meanwhile. And uh, only very few got lost um, uh, over the last five to seven years since they started operation. And um, also that early stage money is no stupid money <laughs> any longer, as people sometimes still tend to say. Mm -hmm. And um, that's presumably the right person or the right institution to, to turn to, institutions like <coughs> these. I, I actually think we do have enough early stage investment in, in, in clean tech, so I'd like to a little bit be a counterbalance here. Uh, I mean, in the end of the day, uh, the bad news for the entrepreneurs here in the room is not everybody will get funded. Um, it is a <laughs> Darwinistic model. Uh, we rely on this being a Darwinistic model. If there's oversupply for uh, uh, the early stage segment, uh, we have a problem. If there's dramatic undersupply, of course, we also have a problem that nobody is going to make it through the gates when we are looking um, at these companies. But I think there's the, the generalist VC funds that are getting more and more into clean tech. In Germany, I can think of very few generalist venture funds that are not doing clean tech. You have, you have uh, the, the Munich Venture Partners, you have Target, you have Wellington. Uh, there's plenty of other funds that do this. You have small regional funds, you have the high-tech Gründer Fund, you have corporates, you have family offices. Um, I think there's plenty of sources for um, early stage companies, but not everyone will get funded. But I do not feel that there is a dramatic gap um, there that not enough companies make it through the funnel. Mm. Well, maybe, maybe just one comment to that. You probably have to look at over the development of the economy. And the tougher the economy becomes, as we have seen over in 2008, 2009, the more risk averse people get, and you see early stage uh, investment suffering out of that. The question is if, if this is good or not good, but uh, these, are, these are the facts. It's highly dependent on, on the status, the situation of the economy. Shall we open it up to the audience? We have many startups in the room, so please uh, prepare your questions and raise your hand and uh, try to get a microphone runner coming to you as quickly as possible. <laughs> Who has a question? Who goes first? Jan Moschon, over there in the corner. <laughs> yes, I uh, would like um, the insights from you guys. How many clean tech companies in Europe could become candidates for IPO in the next three years? All of our portfolio companies. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, if I, I think it's actually less requirement of you know, are the companies there and ready? Do we have the right companies? The question is, question. The, quest, <laughs> the question is, uh, will the market be ready for IPOs again? And we're really not seeing that happening yet. It's very, very difficult. My personal belief is, yes, we will see quite a few. I think we're seeing now 
among the portfolio of the three of us, but also outside of that, we're seeing companies that have, <coughs> have uh, much, much larger revenues than we saw ever uh, you know, mm. five years ago. That's the, we'll see those companies to be ready for IPO. I think there's also a problem with the question, what is a European company? I mean, this is a really very global business. I'll give you an example. We have a company in the portfolio, a German company, a German GmbH. Um, they manufacture power efficient uh, uh, displays. They have 20 employees in Germany and 250 in China and 95 of the revenues in China. And uh, uh, is there a potential for that company go, to go public? Yes, but it will be a Hong Kong listing. It will not be here a listing. And um, I think um, my, my peers here on the panel probably all have similar cases like that in the, uh, in the portfolio. Um, I, I see this less and less being a pure European play. Also, the amount of time we as partners and investors uh, spend outside of Europe. Uh, this is going up dramatically, looking for business partners for the portfolio companies buying add-on acquisitions. We have, um, right now, we have three pending acquisitions in the portfolio where European companies are buying American and Asian companies as, as bold <coughs> on to become uh, international. I think in particular in the clean tech uh, area, there's very few pure European companies and by the time they grow up, they have all international IPO options. So, so how many? How many? When, what year, who the heck knows what's happening <laughs> in, the, in the market. I don't have that crystal ball. I mean, I mean, for us, the goal is always to get the companies to a point where you can go public. So say at least 100 million, nice growth, profitable. Um, and then frankly, the rest is to bigger, bigger factors uh, that are out of our control to, to influence. Where do you have a crisis? Where do you suddenly have a war? And I don't know. No answer. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So who has another question? Stefan in the corner. Emily behind you. Hi, oh, okay. Thanks. Here. Yeah. Thanks. It's uh, Jamie Fulbright from the Carbon Trust. I have a question for Felix, actually. I was interested in your view on uh, corporates, which I agree with as being critical to early stage. I wondered who you see as being um, the ones who are going to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, that's a double-edged sword. I... Uh, we see um, corporates being active. Unfortunately, a lot of the larger corporates are inherently slower than they should be in certain areas when it comes to early stage opportunities, which is a good thing on the other hand, <coughs> because they will have to catch up later on and hopefully buy companies from our portfolios. So yes, we're seeing a lot of them being very active and we really find that a very good news for the young companies, but also for our portfolio companies and for the market overall, but they will always also remain potential acquirers of established companies in the space when they realize they should have been there, but they weren't there. Stefan, yeah? Uh, my question to you guys is what kind of business model is at the moment the preferred business model for you to invest? We just heard uh, that there might be an interest in new service companies? Or are you more interested in pure technology companies? Are you interested in um, new technology implementing companies? So what kind of business models are, are, you, are you looking for? Do you have any trends, any things where you would say, we never do this or that? Well, I, th <clears throat> I think if, if, if I can start here, and probably everybody has similar ideas around that, that aspect. It is, it is not a particular business model or plan or sector or management team or whatever that we are looking for. I think what at least we are looking for is an investment proposition that makes sense. And that varies if you, if you look at this uh, thousand deals that, that you look at every year that varies from situation to situation so you, you know, of course you have certain trends that you like more and some other trends that you like less but uh, but it is very difficult to be very strict on on business models on, on certain aspects but generally you can say 
asset light is easier than asset heavy. Good management team is easier than weak management team. <laughs> uh, sustainable <Smart> performance, <laughs> sustainable performance, and and environment is is easier than heavily uh, 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 subsidized market environments. But then again, you can be in a sub subsidized market environment, which is uh, which is very attractive. So I, I, I can give you an example of a bit business model we're not interested in, and I'm making, making this up. Um, uh, there's a green product. Uh, in order to build it, uh, you need to invest a couple of million. It's only useful to a certain segment of customers in or around Berlin. You have to build it locally, um, and there is no need in other places for this world. And on top of that, this product completely depends on uh, some sort of feed-in tariff. I mean, that's something we're not interested in. You're, you're looking for... Um, for a product um, that easily can scale internationally with ideally very little um, a modification that may be even better. You don't have to manufacture it yourself. You can outsource it to a contract manufacturer or even more better, you don't have to manufacture anything because it's some software code um, that, that uh, customers can download um, for a very hefty payment around the globe. That's sort of the ideal case. <laughs> and the reality is what we see and what we invest in is somewhere in the middle. Further questions? Who has a, a question for the panel? We have uh, three to four more minutes. Use your time or do you want to start the party right now? <laughs> <Drinks>. <laughs> huh? Party? I think they want to party? party? No more questions? Is this our panel? Party. Or do you have a farewell word? Cheers. I have a final. <laughs> Here's a question. Yeah. What about the hot deals uh, up to come? I think. Oh, sorry. It's called hot sectors, hot deals, hot VCs. Yeah. So, so uh, just maybe a, a brief uh, comment on what you expect to be well the hot sectors, the hot deals, and the hot VCs over the next uh, eight months. <laughs> Bruno, now you have to show your underpants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> well. I'm not showing my underpants uh, <laughs> to, to protect everybody in here. But uh, I think uh, the hot VCs you see here, uh, that's the easier one. Uh, now, in, in terms of hot deals, I, I think we are moving into an environment where people have realized that we need uh, more efficiency. We have mentioned that a lot of, a lot of uh, times. I think in terms of efficiency, we need to understand that this is not just a product solution but the system solution and the regulator need to take actions for that so we can finally deploy the technologies that are available for, for, for uh, smart grid applications for instance. I think easy things to save uh, um, energy and money for the people are lighting, uh, heating, uh, these kind of applications we will see moving forward. We have had a long, a fast run on solar, on wind. I think that will continue, even though we have some turbulences in, in feed-in tariffs all over the place, but that will still continue. I'm pretty sure about that. We'll offer interesting investment opportunities for different kind of investors. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that we see quite a few hot sectors on, on this part what I just mentioned. I can, <coughs> it's a difficult question, but um, add a couple of words. One is, and that's very much our investment philosophy, we're looking for products that can save clients money within a year's time. We're seeing areas where that, uh, that uh, period of return shortens and shortens because the requirements are increasing from a regulatory side or just purely from the cost base that they have with the changing energy prices. And I think everybody should really always think how quickly can this product be paid back by savings? That's the fundamental question. Maybe to give you an example of in the sector that we particularly like, which is the water space. Um, in the water area, we're now seeing applications where literally the payback is two or three months for systems that cost a million euros to a client. If you can achieve that, you have a very, very sexy business model. So I have 40 seconds left to answer that question, so I'll make it easy. We are 
closing another investment tomorrow, and it's a, it's a hot company in a hot segment. <laughs> and very tomorrow hot. we very find hot. out more. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to announce it tomorrow? <laughs> maybe, yes. <laughs> okay. Or maybe uh, we start drinking with you and yeah, then we get the information something. earlier. <laughs> All right, give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you.